Hello and welcome to brand new video series called Real Time Object Detection with YOLO version 3. So YOLO stands for You Only Look Once, it's the name of the network architecture that we're going to be using and we'll use version 3 of that. Now Real Time Object Detection means to make detections and localizations of objects on images or videos in real time. That means you don't have to wait for some time to get the output, right? So you input an image or a video and you get the output in real time. So you can make the decisions then and there. So this video series is divided into four parts. Let's have a look. So in this video, we'll try to understand the YOLO version 3 network. It's a very complex network and we'll try to understand how it makes detections. We'll try to understand the mathematics given in the research paper and all of that. So we won't be implementing the network in this video. We'll just understand that. In the next video, we'll implement the network in PyTorch. And after that, we'll implement the input and output pipelines for images, so input images and output images. And in the final video, we'll implement input and output pipelines for videos. So images and videos are treated very differently. So let's move on and try to understand how your version 3 works. First of all, here's a graph representing the speed of YOLO version 3. So it's it's a really fast network, one of the fastest out there. So here it is compared to different kinds of real-time object detection networks such as Retina or SSDs, all of that. So on the x-axis you can see the inference time. So YOLO version 3 is the fastest of them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that YOLO version 3 is the best one out there. You know, there is no best network for each and every case. So depending on uh, your accuracy or your inference time, whatever matters most to you. Uh, in that case, you'll have to use a different network, but it is the fastest among those. Maybe not the most accurate, but the fastest. So, and it's one of the most famous network out there. So let's try to look at some use cases of real-time object detection. So these are various use cases, but I'll mention a few of my favorites. So first of all, real-time object detection is used for making real-time decisions in self-driving cars. So make better decisions than humans. So, but for making even a simple decision, these cars need to have a vision. These cars need to, you know, localize and detect objects. And they can make decisions only based on that. And those decisions have to be real time, you know, because it's a matter of life and death sometimes. So, well, to make real life decisions, they use object detection, which is real time, of course. It is also used for image segmentation in med medical imaging. Now, that is not necessarily always real time because doctors have time to, you know, infer, uh, infer a disease or something like that. But uh, nowadays, there are networks being implemented that can detect uh, and segment things in real time. So that is another use case. Now, detecting face in facial recognition software. So most of the smartphones or laptops these days have facial recognition software, so they can recognize faces. In order to recognize face, they need to first detect the portion of the image that contains the face. So you you must have seen in your selfie cam, you know, it automatically makes a, a bounding box around your face. So that is called detecting a face. It's not recognizing, it's just detecting the uh, part of the image that contains the face. So that is called facial detection. That is not recognition. So facial recognition software first detects the face in the part of the image and then, and then it runs its recognition software to match your face with the database stored in the device itself. Then, based on the response, it will either unlock the device or perform a particular given action. And then it provides assistive security in smart homes. So there are various use cases in the smart homes. For example, the doorbell camera contains uh, recognition software. It can, rec it can recognize a frequent visitor. It can recognize strangers. It can recognize you know, some, some uh, unwanted activity uh, goes on outside your house. It, it can send you notifications in real time. So that, that is where the real time object detection comes in. And there are various other use cases. So moving on. So let's look at what we are building. We'll build a real time object detection based on YOLO version 3, which will work on both images and videos. So for example, this might be the output. If you give an input image, you will get this output. You know, it, de it detects cars and trucks and the value written, the numerical value written on top of that is just the probability of the network, right? The network has detected that this is a car with probability of 75%. Uh, so that's just that, nothing else. It can detect a person and all of that. Thing. Let's look at another example. So this is another example. It detects person, zebra line, and then uh, cars and stuff. This is another example, you know, you have chairs detected in the image, a clock here, and finally we have this, it doesn't add anything to the output, but I had to use this picture because I'm a Barca fan, so yeah, that's it. We can also apply this to real-time 
video detection but i'm not putting it up here in the presentation because i was getting really low frame rates so we'll look at video detection in the last video of this series where we'll just build the input output pipeline and then just look at the output so these are images okay now back to yolo it stands for you only look once as i've already mentioned in the beginning it is a custom object detector network we have mentioned this several times now it is originally based on darknet this is an important part Darknet is a neural network library written in C and CUDA. So the original YOLO network is based on Darknet. By the author of the research paper, the Darknet library is maintained and he has written this entire network using Darknet. But we will use PyTorch. We will implement the network in PyTorch. Now, this is the entire network. This is the entire architecture of the network. So the number of layers does not matter because there are many versions of YOLO version 3. It's called tiny YOLO and you know, a lot of versions. So the number of layers does not matter, but the types of layers, they do matter here. So first of all, let's look at different types of layers. The first is residual block. So residual net block is basically uh, a residual network, uh, resonates, right? So there are many building residual blocks in the YOLO version 3 network that is denoted by pink color. Now, you might see the vertical yellow line that is another layer that is detection layer so in this architecture yellow version 3 detection happens at three stages at three scales basically so first with stride 32 then with stride 16 and then with stride 8 so you can see a dog image right in front of you this network is detecting from that image three times at different scales this is what is meant by detection happening at three stages all right so the detection part of the network is Called detection layer and it is mentioned in yellow color or brownish yellow whatever that is now the green color part is upsampling layer so you upsample an image before you know changing the scale so you every time you upsample an image so you can see the first time the image is really small and then it's upsampled and then it is again upsampled at third scale all right now you might have seen the plus sign and the star symbol so the plus sign basically means addition. So this is what happens in uh, residual blocks. So you basically add previous networks. So that is that does not need any explanation. If you are not familiar with ResNets, you can watch the video that I have made on ResNets, understanding the ResNet paper and then implementing the ResNet from scratch. So that is there. But I assume that you know what ResNets are. You have a basic idea of that, right? But this is something new, the, the concatenation. So concatenation is something that I came across here in YOLO version 3 while studying YOLO version 3. So the author has called it routing layer so it just routes so what basically means is it just concatenates the output of some previous layer into this layer it basically means that so you know you get the general idea it's just saying that you concatenate uh, whatever you have learned from previous layers to this layer so it basically means that so i've mentioned a lot of technical details in this slide so let us just study each one of those separately so first of all let's study the feature of the network a quick revision and by the way, sorry for the noise outside. There's a lot of traffic today. So yeah, sorry for that. Just don't mind. All right. So the first feature detection happens at in three stages or scales that I've already mentioned. So you can see in the image, three different scales. Those scales can be called three different stages. All right. Each grid makes three predictions using three anchor boxes. Now, let me explain this. So each grid, which means an image is divided into multiple grids or multiple cells, whatever you want to call, right? Right. So 13 by 13 or 16 by 16, whatever that is. So each grid makes three predictions. So it will predict three bounding boxes. In the output, the box containing an object is called the bounding box. So each cell will detect three shapes of bounding box using three anchor boxes. What are anchor boxes? So in YOLO version 3, in this research paper, a new concept was introduced called anchor boxes. So in previous versions, there were no anchor boxes. The cells, the network made predictions of the boxes, the size and width of the height and width of the boxes. But in this, there are predefined size, heights and widths of the object, or height and widths of the anchor boxes, or the height and widths of the bounding boxes. So those are called anchor boxes, the predefined ones. So each grid will make three predictions using three anchor boxes. So that makes nine predictions for using nine anchor boxes if you take into consideration all the three scales. So which means we have to have nine anchor boxes. So that is already provided to us by the author. But there arises a question, how do you choose the height and width of nine anchor boxes? 
These anchor boxes are chosen using k-means clustering. So I'll quickly mention what that does. When you're training a network, you already know the output, right? So what it happens is it selects k using k-means clustering. It selects most common output shapes, nine most common bonding box shapes, and then those are called the anchor boxes. Anchor box now finally, a cell is selected if the center of the object falls in the receptive field of that cell. So a cell makes three predictions. Now that cell will be considered for the final output if the center of a particular object falls in the receptive field of that cell. So that makes sense. So if you don't didn't understand any other concept, just go ahead and rewatch that, rewind it because it's really important. This is one of the most important part of the network. Now we'll move on to some other technical aspects in the next slide. So we'll study the output of the network and it's really important that you get this part. It will become much more clear when we try to implement it, but it's really important that you get it. Equation of the output dimension at each cell. Here's the formula. Number of prediction per cell times five plus number of objects to be detected. All of it makes sense except for the number five. Why is five there? So here's what it is. Five basically accounts for five coordinates. So the center coordinates of the cell, the x and y, right? And then height and width of the cell, that makes it four. And then detection confidence. Detection confidence basically means that this cell contains an object, okay? The probability that this cell contains a particular object, the center of a particular object is called detection confidence. And then you have the number of objects to be detected. So in this case, Prediction per cell is 3 as I've already mentioned and the number of the objects to be predicted is 80 because we are using COCO dataset. It has 80 objects. So what are these 80 what, what are these 80 you know, numbers? What do they actually contain? These contain the probability of that object being if this, these 80 objects are one hot encoding of you know various objects such as cars, chairs, horse, dogs, whatever. It will contain, all of them will contain a probability that it is a car, a horse or an object. So here's the thing. If you already have the probability of 80 objects, what's the need of having a detection confidence? Well, what if the cell has no object? What if detection confidence is less than a particular threshold? We'll consider that there is no object that is in the uh, bounding box. So we won't bother to look at those 80 probabilities. So I hope you understood this. Okay, now it was the output at each cell. Now what about output at each scale? Well, you basically just multiply this with the number of cells. So it makes sense. Output at each cell is multiplied by number of cells and we get the output at each scale. So, so for example, if the three scales here are maybe 8 by 8, 16 by 16 or 32 by 32, you know, it can be whatever, depending on the size of the input image. For example, if the grid distribution is 16 by 16, so the output at each scale will be 3 into 85 times 16 by 16 but this is four dimensional output and to make things easier in code we'll convert into two dimensional so we'll just have 768 or whatever the number be times 85 because we need to look at these 85 coordinates to make the bounding boxes so that is it so for other scales it is z times 85 so whatever the scale might be it is z times 85 so if it is in this type of uh, dimension we can just concatenate all the outputs together at three scales you know and then we can predict the uh, output so to make things more concrete here is the pictorial representation of uh, what i've just mentioned prediction feature map at different scales so on the left side you can see different scales the image is divided into different scales 13 by 13 26 by 26 and 52 by 52 now let's consider 13 by 13 scale here on the right side so each of the cell will predict three bounding boxes, as you can see here, box one, box two, and box three. Each of these boxes have certain number of attributes. Now those attributes are five here, five plus class scores. So the five coordinates consist of T, X, and T, Y, that is the center coordinate X and Y, T, W, and T, H, the height and width of the bounding box. Then the object next score, and then the class scores. And all of that is multiplied P times that is the number of prediction each cell makes and that is 3 in this case. So I guess you got it. Now what are the next steps? Well we make predictions using the output. We have a lot of outputs. Now we'll try to make predictions using that output. 
we have probabilities and out of those probabilities we'll take the highest probability and that is the object that we have so to predict the bounding boxes according to the research paper here is the formula that is used now that is bx by b b w and b h b x b y is the center coordinates of the bounding boxes and b h n b w are the height and width of the object so so t x and t y are the coordinates of the center that we have predicted so that is sent that is passed into a sigmoid function to convert it between 0 and 1 that is added to the x and y coordinate of the cell the grid that is cx and cy so why is it important to pass it into a sigmoid function because you know we already we have to add a value between 0 and 1 to cx and cy because we already know that they are grid numbers so we already know their position so we ha it has to be between 0 and 1 and then the height and width is predicted by this given formula pw and ph are the height of the anchor boxes that we already have that and these are the formulas so there is no way to derive them well of course there might be a way but this is how it's used by author it's completely intuitive now next step is to concatenate the outputs at various scales so as i've already mentioned there are three scales direction and the output uh, we get is of four dimensions then we convert it into two dimensions so that it is easier to concatenate them so after concatenating them you know you will get something like this first bounding box at 000, zero uh, at 00, zero coordinate there are three bounding boxes at 00, zero and there are three bounding boxes at 01 and yeah there are multiple bounding boxes at every scale so we'll concatenate them together to make predictions now what if each object has multiple detections so maybe a dog is detected at first scale then at second scale and then also at third scale you know network might get confused right so each object has to be detected only once not multiple times so which one of those detections will you choose as the best one so there comes another algorithm in computer vision that is called non-max suppression so it will suppress all the other detections but output only the most appropriate one we won't study that algorithm but you know this is what it does so use non-max suppression to get rid of multiple detections of same object. It is important that you get how multiple detections of same object happens. So maybe that network thinks that the center of this object is at this grid at this scale and at next scale and at maybe at next scale or maybe multiple grids in the same scale. There are various possibilities. So that is why uh, it is uh, non-max suppression is used to get rid of detection of same objects. So it looks something like this. Before non-max suppression, you know, this car is detected multiple times, you know, some bonding boxes have detected. But the best one is in the center. So after non-max suppression, you'll get only that. Now draw the remaining bonding boxes. After non-max suppression, we have gotten rid of all the outputs that we don't need. We'll draw the bonding boxes using OpenCV using... So these are the stages. You know, first we have the image, then we'll detect multiple objects, and then we'll see, okay, if... This, these detections are actually objects looking at the objectness confidence in this case all of them are some detections so now after that use nms non-max suppression to get rid of multiple detections and have the best ones so these are the steps here so it's important that you understand it and there are various articles on the internet so if you have not gotten a particular part of it you know the output dimensions or whatever just look it up because it's really important all right so that's it in this video. In the next one, we'll actually implement the network. It's going to be really amazing. We'll implement a network from a configuration file and then and we'll understand how that network works. It's, it's really something that we have not done yet on my channel. So, thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next one.